Well, good morning, everybody. If you're on the West Coast, uh, good afternoon if you're anywhere else in North America. And good evening if you're in the United Kingdom, Ireland, Europe, or the Middle East, which is where Keith Hole is, our, our guest for Larry Wilson Live with the next hour. So, Keith, um, thanks very much for, uh, for coming on the show. Um, 600 people registered for this, Keith. Um, I know some of them are just really curious to hear what you have to say in terms of, you know, what, what's real out there and what really works, what, what doesn't may be. But I also know there's a ton of people out there that know you, have heard you speak before, and they're just dying to hear what you have to say. Me too. Um, I've enjoyed every conversation we had. So, um, is there anybody in particular you want to thank out there, Keith, other than maybe your mom or, or somebody before we get going? I, I, I just want to thank all the people out there for giving us the opportunity for supporting people. I follow something called Action for Happiness. It says thank three people that have given you the opportunity. So, Larry, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> I want to thank Sylvia Kramer at GLC who introduced us in Prague many years ago. Um, where we had the opportunity to meet and talk about some of these things we're going to talk about tonight. And obviously I, I am going to just thank uh, the people that are joining us tonight to be here, have some questions, join the conversations. I am from the UK. I'm British, well, English. So I am going to say, I hope you've got your cup of tea ready because that's, that's how we do everything. If you've got to think about something, you get your brew on. So hope you've all got your cup of tea. And it, I'm really just excited to be here and talk to you. Well, um, and me too, Keith. Now, it's just to go back to what you said about how we met in Prague at the GLC conference, um, and uh, I, I was speaking on the second day, and afterwards, sorry, everybody, I, I've been doing a lot of webinars to India, and for whatever reason, I think I have to project my voice across the whole Pacific Ocean, so <laughs> uh, I need, need a lot to drink, but um, the... Sylvia, and you came up to me and you said, "Hey, Larry, could you uh, could you open up the conference in in Berlin? It's a much bigger conference. You have more people there. We'd really like you to set the tone for the whole conference." And I was re really flattered. And I said, "Sure." And uh, you know, we did the conference in Berlin. Uh, we did the book signing, and there was, I think, you folks, 184 delegates out there. Very uh, lots of really. Uh, great people, high level, some really, really good speakers. And I signed 184 books. And just when we were all packing up at the end, Keith, I mean, you were there. I mean, you know, you didn't have to, but you're, you know, you're there helping everybody pack up. So am I. I mean, the show's over, right? It's not so glamorous now. And as Sylvia is right there, I had one copy of the book left. And I said, Sylvia, would you, would you like one? And very politely, she just looked at me and she said, Larry, I look after lots of conferences, but I'm not really a health and safety specialist. And I realized that probably who put all of those really, and who knew who all those really good speakers were and who was who and who should be at that conference Probably wasn't Sylvia because she was being fairly straightforward going, hey, you know, I put conferences on, but I don't necessarily get into it. All the management conferences, the accounting conferences, the legal conferences, the safety conferences. I just try to put on really good conferences, which she does. So it made me think, Keith, that, you know, you get to talk to all these people, really. You get more of a chance to get in depth than probably any of us do. Your personality is, you know, you've got that bartender kind of personality where people just talk to you. And now I find out from you that that's actually how you got all started. But you've got a chance. I mean, and I obviously don't want you to, you know, um, do anything that might jeopardize future business with any of your clients in terms of, you know, this guy stinks. Um, no, no, no. But you do know, you kind of do get an opportunity to sift through things at a deeper level than most of us are ever going to get a chance for. So uh, can you start off telling us, how did you get into this 
whole behavioral aspect of safety. I mean, I know, but I think it's fun. Well, absolutely, Larry. No, it's brilliant. And I've got to say, um, we have got someone in the chat window, a LinkedIn user, and he's actually says, sorry, at 7 p.m. He's had to move on from the tea to the beer, but you're still welcome. And that's really <laughs> where I started. You know, I actually started many years ago when I, when I left school, I worked as a barman. I, I was working as a barman. I moved on. I started running my own pubs. And um, when you're running a pub, one of the things you want is you want people to come in. You want people to engage. You want people to talk to you. You want people to want to be there. And you want people to behave how you want them to behave. Because you want them to come in your pub. And you want them to have a drink. But you also want them to behave. And that's how I got into behavioral management, you know, helping to get people to do the right things. And I, I challenge anyone when you've got a, you know, we call it football over here and football's where the ball goes along the ground. And I'm going to offend a few people the other side of the pond there. But oh, no, football's when it goes on the ground. And when you've got a pub full of 200 people watching football on a screen with a beer, you need to keep control of those. And there's just me. So you've got to learn about behavioral management. You've got to learn how to get people to do what you want them to do. And that's really like, how I got into safety. With the front, like that's, 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 I mean, managing drunks. I mean, come on, kids, it doesn't get much, but you're right. I mean, if you don't do it, you can't have the police come into your pub every night. Right. Obviously. Well, exactly. And if you did, they'd close you down. So you're there. Uh, and I've got to say it's, it's about getting people to understand what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, and how you want them to behave. I was in South London, and we know the stories about people that drink in South London and hooligans and things like that. But ultimately, we, we, don't, getting, we, we don't know. We don't know any about. Well, them. There, there's. But when I was in pubs, you know, pre two thousand, you had some lively characters there. But you <laughs> are trying to get them to engage, and you're using those positive reinforcements. You're using those positive engagements to get people to do what you want them to do. And it is about looking at people are the solution and not the problem. You know, and it's getting people to understand that this is the way things should be working and this is how it's done. So it is very much moving from that where you are uh, working to. And Mraz, thank you for that. Yes, it is illegal to sell alcohol to someone who's already drunk. <laughs> it's a key licensing law. What I, I want to know, I'm challenging, I'm challenging people as well. Um, you know, if they can name the, we'll see in the quiz if someone can tell the four people that you are not allowed to serve in a pub. We'll see if that comes up at the end. Well, but, but Keith, like the point you made to me though, too, is that you know, obviously, from a business point of view, if you cut everybody off and you don't serve any alcohol or only one drink to everybody, you're not going to be in business very long either because you're not going to have any money. So the whole balance, managing the behavior positively is phenomenal training ground. I think everybody would agree. Um, you know, if I was in Hollywood and I was typecasting a bartender, I'd probably pick somebody like you because you sure look the part. But then you got you expanded that to training other pub owners, et cetera. So tell Absolutely. us Absolutely. So, so one, one, one of the things I used to do was I used to train people. Um, I used to train people to actually run pubs because you had a lot of people that would come out of college. They'd come out of school and they'd have a business degree and they could write you a great business plan. And um, then you've got to say to them, say, that business plan's brilliant. But how are you going to deal with that? those four people in the corner which are scaring all your other customers off? Because right. you can't fight. You know, so you've got, you've got to win them over. You've got, to, you've got to turn. My key challenge, the thing for me, and this is very much in terms of bringing safety home as well, the key thing for me, I knew when I'd actually kind of started turning that corner because they might start bringing their families in. So you'd find that the the... Um, atmosphere of the pub would change so you'd find people you what you know all all joking aside you know you'd have the guys that would drink in there and they might actually start bringing their wives in on sunday they might start bringing the family in or they'd bring people in they'd have meetings because they realized that it was a nice place to be and they wanted to be there and they wanted to be part of that family and safety is very similar 
you yeah, you're trying yeah. to get people to come in there and say, look, we want to do this because we want you to go home safe. We want you to come to work and have a great time. And we want you to look after each other. And we want you to get home safe. It's a very similar message. You just want people to be part of a family. So you went from training the other pub owners. Um, you know, certainly you, you then saw the, the connection here to safety. I mean, I can, I, I can see it. I've even heard this from some of our companies where they actually say, we want a place that you would be proud to bring your kids here to work. And they actually get, they measure kind of this in terms of how many of their kids actually apply for summer jobs and things like that, right? Which I think is just, you know, it's a steel mill, right? It's, you know, it's, there's risk. Um, Keith, just before I get you to start talking about what's au courant and what's good and all the rest of it, um, let me just, uh, if I can, everybody, uh, a couple of uh, Keith's credentials or accolades, um, specialist in international accreditation and the implementation of behavioral management techniques and health and safety, serving member of council for the global safety body, the institution of occupational safety and health, a fellow of IOSH and IIRSM, past vice chairman of the IOSH construction group, supporting close to 50,000 members worldwide, and um, in independent consultant and thought leader, um, and uh, goes uh, goes by the safety man and at safety Tweety, although he does say right on his website, you've been warned if you go to uh, at safety Tweety. Um, safety and health professionals, 25 most influential individuals in health and safety 2020, top speaker at GLC Europe, HSC Summit 2021, standing chairman for GLS Europe conferences, been published uh, in Health and Safety International, which is a great magazine, by the way, um, for the last four years. And it kind of goes on and on, Keith. Uh, yeah, um, there's literally another uh, 10 bullet points here. Um, well done, by the way. Uh, and again, the, the other thing, just as an aside, everybody, when you're presenting at a conference, there is a very good chance that you've presented this material more than once before, probably more than a hundred times before. When you're the MC at a conference, you are really hoping that when you reach into that wit deck of cards, you don't draw a blank, but you are on stage and you've got nothing much to prep with. You've got the whole energy of the room that is basically yours to carry or lose um you can make it or break it for the conference and everyone i've been to keith you've done an incredible job so uh good on you for that um and also like i said you know in terms of your personality i think probably you got a good chance to get to know a lot of the folks so um here's the list everybody and um i'm not going to be too prescriptive here but We've got behavior-based safety. That was maybe one of the first sort of things. Obviously, as I said before, leadership, uh, culture change. There's a number of folks out there and have been for a long time. Um, there's the new concept of mindfulness, Keith, and there was a, a lady that spoke at that HSE 360 conference that I thought was really interesting. Um, say industry 4.0, safety 2.0, safety differently, and, and HOP or human optimization and performance. So um, maybe do you want to just start with your take on BBS when you first heard about it, Keith? And uh, you, you can kind of go from there. I'll, I'll prompt you a bit here and there. But um, uh, well, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about behavioral behavioral based. Based. Go, tell, just yeah, go for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Let's talk about behavioral based safety. Behavioral based safety is all about positive reinforcement. It's the same way you train everything. So behavioral based safety is about focusing on those positives. So if you go on a construction site and you're looking around that construction site and you've got a hundred people and one person's not wearing their hard hat, do you know what? Let's focus on that positive and let's praise the fact that you've got 99% compliance. And too often in safety, and I've definitely seen this in safety. Too often in safety, people love to find the thing that's wrong. They like to be technically right. And whenever you're doing anything like that, we've got to actually remember 
but we're all aiming for the best thing. We're all aiming for the safety. Now, some of these conferences, I love surrounding myself with people that I believe are cleverer than me. And Larry, you're one of those people there. You, you know, I, I know you know a lot more about this than me. And But when we're looking, you do get safety people start arguing about how to do safety. Yeah, actually, if I turn around to you and I said, right, Larry, do you want everyone to go home safe? You're going to go, of course I do, Keith. If I turn around to some of these other people and I am putting names, so I've got Anne Isaacs is in the chat window. And if I said, Anne, do you want everyone to go home safety? What are you going to say? You're going to say yes. We've got Jimmy Quinn there, James Quinn, fantastic man. He's, he's from Glasgow. I've never had a drink with him, but I'm not sure I want to because I know I'd lose. But James Quinn, brilliant guy. And if I said to James Quinn, James, do you want everyone to go home safely? He's going to say yes. But this is why you call it an argument of safety professionals. You get them in all in a room and they start agreeing violently on the best way to do stuff. And absolutely, what we do brilliant. Is, agree violently on the agree best. Agree, they you do. You get people going. Well, I do safety this way. I'll give you. I'll give you an anecdote. Okay. Well, no, but Keith, you know, remember when when I brought Jim Spigner uh, from well, yeah, he's Decro, but from Chief Client Officer from. Uh, uh, Decra, BSD, everybody, if you're familiar with the, the lineage or the history. Um, and, and when people were like, well, you, you bring a competitor on the show. And I said, well, look, we've been competitors for over 30 years. Okay. I don't know how many thousand injuries he's helped to prevent. And whether that's a thousand more or a thousand less than I have. But I mean, that the guy has done a tremendous amount of good in his career is unquestionable. Let's hear what he's got to say, his perspective, right? You know, I mean, the fact that we might be playing on different ball teams isn't necessarily mean it isn't the same sport, right? Um, yet the, the, the competitive nature of it all can actually get to mudslinging, almost like politics, right? Which I find to be just like going, guys, you know, I mean, this isn't a glamorous profession to start off with. So at the very least, anybody that is doing anything to help other people, you know, get home safe, get back to work safely the next day. I mean, you can't take that away from them, let alone, you know, say anything derogatory about it. You, I, may, I like, you may like your methodology better. Hopefully you do. Um, or you wouldn't be doing it. Right. But, but I don't want to get people like, I don't want to get people that go, Oh, this is better than that, or that's better than that. Do you know what the great thing is? Is do something. So whether you agree with safety two, whether you agree with safety 24-7, whether you're into your behavioral-based safety, what you should do is you're doing something different. And because you're doing something different, you're going to get conversations and you're going to have differences. So the fact is you want to just encourage people to actually – just do different. And it's an old saying, if you do what you always did, you get what you always got. So whichever one of these systems you decide to pick up, do it. And whether people agree with you, people might say, well, that system's better. It doesn't matter. You're doing something. And by doing something, you're going to have people start having these conversations. They're going to have safety behavioral discussions, which means you're going to be talking safety, which means you're focusing on the right thing which is actually we just want to get everyone home safe. I'm going to hold up a slide. I know, I know we said, so I have got some props here. So I'm just going to hold that. And I'm going to talk about this. Now, if you look at that, and I won't read these out, but you look at that. A lot of people start their safety over there, don't they? They measure their accidents and near misses. Though suddenly they start measuring accidents, near misses, site inspections. They suddenly get all these numbers. But you know what? What you want to do is that. What you want to look at, is you just want to talk through, and I'm going to try and bring that in there. So there you go. You just want to measure what needs to be focused on in the business right now to keep improve success and keep everyone safe. So don't just talk about, you know, one thing. Don't have a look at all these different standards. Change it. Do you know what? One month, one month, why don't you measure the number of site audits? Next month, why don't you measure the number of people complying with a certain standard? Because what you measure gets done and what you report on gets done even faster. So don't stick always with your static measures. Just pick one and go, do you know what? We've got a problem with people turning up and they're not wearing high-vis. You measure that, it will go up. 
people not turn doing a certain filling certain forms in measure it it goes up so you need to change every so often to keep things fresh keep people engaged but just, but just one thing but just one thing at a time you're saying sorry everybody just help people understand what you want to look at and what you want to improve you okay. know when you when you repair your house when you repair your house unless you're brave you might decide to refit the kitchen and then you might decide to repat redo the patio you don't get a house and you go i'm gonna rip out my bathroom rip out my kitchen get rid of my living room decorate the bedrooms all at the same time do you no no you no kind of go let's do let's do one thing well and do it properly and then when it's done well we can sit back we can admire that we can we can tick that box and go we've succeeded we've done something and then move on but too many people try to focus on everything and what you're asking me what works on the ground you've got the people on the ground they're in a flat spin they no, just want to do their job and you're suddenly making them measure 20 things no, all but they want to do is do their job. I think the I, I think that's actually really um, it's subtle, but I think it's uh, certainly my experience with behavior based safety, which is <laughs> a bit like you said. Um, You've got a bit of experience there, Larry. Well, first fifteen years, yeah, yeah um, teaching people how to make observations uh, and track them and all the rest of it. You know, it's where safe sort of evolved out of and all. But um, yeah. the idea that you did one thing well versus what quite often would happen would be they'd focus on two or three, if you will, areas of problem or concern and be happy with a 50% sort of improvement in three variables. The idea of, no, guys, let's, because I, I didn't recommend this, Keith, and I should have. I mean, stick, just pick one, do it well, so that when you kind of showcase, look what happened, you've actually got something to showcase instead of, uh, you know, we got the water temperature a bit warmer, right? You know, but we didn't, not wow, right? Tick so, that box and yeah. feed back. So when you turn around, if you do something, if your people on site go, can we do this? Put it on there and go, you said we did. Tell people, give them the feedback. Let them know, do you know what? We needed to improve here and we have. So give people the praise for going on that journey with you. Because too often, you bring an initiative in, you throw it at the people on site, the people in the offices go, oh, we've got an initiative, we must be engaged. And the people on site are going, but you still want me to do this job, you still want me to build this, you still want me to do my day job, and you've thrown all this extra stuff. At least help me focus on, you know, what, what we need to do. What is, you can't have more than one priority. It's... um. It's the thing that we say. It's why it's called a priority. <laughs> you can only do one. When you've got a to-do list, I always say to people, at the top of your to-do list, the first thing you write is write a to-do list. You tick that off when you've written your to-do list because you're suddenly a success. You've done one thing on your to-do list, haven't you? So just well, always think, focus on those positives. Well, I, I think, first of all, focus on the positives. We, I, we also, I know, keep that. Um, you know, we should move on to some of the other uh, some of the other ones. Besides, but for behavioral safety, focus on the positive. Which um, I'm just gonna the part that he didn't throw in everybody about the 99 people wearing the hard hat, the one person not, is that the one person not getting talked to about not wearing the hard hat is the way you'd want to bet for almost every behavior based safety implementation, even though. The whole idea is to be tracking safe behavior and trends and improvements in safe behavior. When you're engaged in the employee and the observation, you're not just looking for, you know, positive reinforcement for what the person's doing right, potentially some uh, positive suggestions or corrections for any at-risk behavior, but you're also looking for front-end opportunities to be able to either engineer or eliminate out the hazard um, and the the session that Keith moderated that I just put on for GLC, it was a, a professional development session on human factors and behavior-based safety and why you need both for operational excellence. And the, the observation video that I showed, which, by the way, thanks very much to all the GLC people. I think they were running around the back halls to get that video to play for us, Keith. But um, it was a... It was a good observation, but there was a front end opportunity where he said, hey, any chance 
you could string those hoses up like you did the paint gun so you couldn't trip on them. He said, yeah, I could actually, good idea. And then when he, he was transferring the liquids, the painting liquid, I uh, didn't have a face shield on. He said, you know, uh, it's not like you're necessarily going to splash anything. You got safety glasses on, but what about a face shield? And he said, you know, that would be another great idea. So now you've got improvements on the back end if there is an error for whatever you know balance traction grip error and a splash with the paint he's got his face protected so you don't always get an observation with a front end and a back end improvement keith you know at all the videos we've got that's probably yeah. one of the best that's you why i showed it but it's good i mean it's good for that and then you said the thing that maybe they could take away is just improve one thing at a time, nail it down, not three or four and go for 20, 30, 50% improvement. So that would be, um, was your take on it though, that it was a bunch of BS when it first came in, when they came out with the ABC theory and all that stuff? No, Keith? no, I think, I think that's good. And what we're talking about with behavioral base, that's moving really nicely into safety too. Because when you okay, look at behavioral base safety, you're talking about focusing on those positives. When you look at safety two, your key principle on safety two is about challenging things, looking at things and making people the solution, not the problem. And to be honest, if you looked at safety differently, you can probably get a sheet of tissue between the two different techniques because they both talk about those key principles. The first thing, people are your solution. So therefore, talk to them. Isn't Help that them. also germane to the whole HOP philosophy? Absolutely. As well? It fits exactly the same in. Um, principle two is, you know, look at those positives, focus on the positives and reward the positives. But then the third one is the fact, the fact that you're talking about people and you're talking about how we support people because people are the ones we have to support. So it is a fact when you're looking at those three principles there, you do have that thing that people are the solution. Safety is about positives, and safety is an ethical responsibility. I sometimes challenge people, and I say to them, I say, look, really, you can do safety as well as me. And they go, but, but you've got these qualifications, you've done this. Do you know what? If you've got a family, do you not want your family to come home safe at the end of the day? So you must, if you've got a family, you've got children, you do safety very, very well because you want them to be safe every day. So what we've got to do, what we've got to make sure, is that's all we do. Larry, you, me, all we're trying to do is to get people home to their families. It shouldn't be that yeah. difficult. And if that's the mindset you've got, that we just want people to go home safe, do you know what? It will happen naturally. And that's where you've got to engage with people. Well, what Keith? What about the 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 pundits or the skeptics who are saying, "Are you are you telling me that you can, you can just use positives, just use positive reinforcement, and you can somehow get all of the people to make different decisions?" That part's a stretch in and of itself, without sort of some negative accountability for performance. Obviously, you know, like, but the the next part is that the, the errors that people make that can get themselves hurt, like missing a stop sign, missing a red light, Absolutely. losing so, your balance and falling, those, those sorts of things getting fixed simply with positive reinforcement. They're, like I said, there's a lot of people that say, no, you can't get there. Complete from and absolutely. So, Larry, this is where we're moving into HOP and human organizational performance. So the key principles of human organizational performance are that people make errors. People making errors is likely, it's predictable. You know, uh, to talk about it. So, Larry, I'm sure you have for gonna, at least 40 I'm years. I'm, just, I'm doing okay on the people making yeah, errors. But, but at least, for, for at least, yeah, at least yeah. 40 years, Larry, at least 40 years, you've put one foot in front of the other, haven't you? Well, if I was to hold up and go, Larry Wilson, are you competent to walk down that street? You'd go, of course I am, Keith. I've been walking years. Yeah. I started, I was an early walker. I learned to walk at two. My parents were very proud. I walked everywhere. I walked to the shops. Well, unless you were oh, at California, you'd have probably driven. But you walk everywhere. All right? <laughs> so you've got experience walking. Larry, have you, in the last month, tripped over your own feet? Oh, yes. Exactly. Right. I, people I, make I, errors. 
in the article, I even used that saying, look, the expression he tripped over his own feet didn't start because he tripped over a cord that somebody else left there and hence it's not my fault. Do you get it, everybody? We all have lost our balance, traction or grip without a culpable hazard. So for heaven's sake, so, so we absolutely we need yeah. yeah, we've got to take these things and we've got to say, right, people make errors. So let's use that hierarchy of risk. Let's people are human, they get things wrong, and people will have that thing. There there might be mental health if you know they might have stress at home. When I say mental health, they could have stress at home. So he's walked out onto site, and why hasn't he put his hard hat on? Because he's just had a phone call from home. Or she's had a phone call from home and it's just forgotten. It's gone out their head. They've distracted, haven't they? They're distraction. So we need to design systems that says, yes, positive behavior will get you so far, but then you've got to build simple procedures to help people do the right things. Now, I am going to take a little, sorry, I want to show people this book, okay? okay. And I talk about this book a lot. That is not a safety book, okay? It's by Donald A. Norman. It's not a safety book. But what it talks about is how. Well, the title you... is The Design of Things, everybody. I don't know if you were as, you know, as quick as I am to need your glasses there. Design of Everyday Things. Thank you. So that talks about, it's not a safety book. It talks about how we get things wrong as people because the design doesn't help our inner model. Now, there was someone said, you know, in order for there to be a violation, there must by definition be a rule and a deliberate intention to break it. If there's no rule, there's no violation properly. Unfortunately, people have an inner rule book. So when you see a door, sometimes you'll go up to that door and your brain will go, ah, that's a push door or that's a pull door. And you'll push that door and it won't open because the design of the door has tricked your inner rule book, your inner monologue, into thinking it's a rule door. Now, that's called a Norman door after that. And I say the same with safety. If you see a door and it's got a label on that says push or pull, I challenge you to say that door is a really badly designed door. If you've got to label something that we need, if we need to like how many people, how many doors have you been through today, Larry? Well, exactly. I, I, I know you told me. And, and, and I, suddenly we need to start labeling them. So therefore, what we need to do is you need to look at your processes and your procedures and go, how can we make this more simple so we don't need to label it? We don't need to put a sign there that says caution trip hazard. Yeah. How well, do we well, help people not have errors? Now, Keith, this might sound hypocritical since, you know, obviously I've been in behavior-based safety in total now for over 30 years. But um, I, I do also want to at least put a word out there or in sympathy for some of the people who go, well, wait a minute. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm all for being positive and all the rest of this stuff. But you've also got to be, you know, acquiesce that human nature being what it is isn't perfect to begin with either. So I was riding up in the gondola with a man whose wife is a neurosurgeon, not a virologist. He was quick to point that out. And she told him that the, the whole pandemic was a hoax. And I, I said, well, you know, other than, you know, all the dead people, I said, it's, it's potentially believable. But I said, uh, you know, he, he, he took his mask off right away. Didn't want to wear it in the gondola. And I said, you know, if this was a couple of weeks ago and it was minus 25 Celsius, minus 35 with the wind chill up here at the top, that little mask wouldn't be enough for you. You'd have to be wearing a neoprene one because otherwise you'd get frostbite, just like nobody's making you wear gloves right now, are they, sir? So to your point, Keith, you know, not only if you could design it so that it was intuitive, but if you could design it so that it was better than not having it in the first place and get people to see it, like for instance, a helmet is better than a hat. And I don't care who you are out there listening, it's waterproof, the hat isn't, and it's gonna offer you a lot more protection than that toque ever will, even if it's got a pom-pom on it. So when I talk to ski patrollers who aren't wearing a helmet, 
I'm trying to convince them. I'm saying, hey, look, I fought it for a while too, you guys, but I said, it's actually way better than the hat. It's more comfortable and it's waterproof. You better check, you should check it out. And sure enough, that worked way better than reading them the Sermon on the Mount. So I think if you could combine those two things, Keith, you know, that, and not only that, if you communicate to everybody that this is the direction we're working, can you put up with what we've got in the meantime till we get there? That's going to make it a lot easier on them too, right? Well, so, absolutely. We've, we've got to change people's inner rules because people have a set way of doing stuff. And a lot of the things with safety is helping people to change their inner rule book that they've grown up with, their nurture, the, well, I've always done it this way, changing that inner rule book. A great example is people that won't wear safety glasses. And you see it all the time. And I've, I've been up to people. And I, I said to a guy on site, I said, why aren't you wearing your safety glasses? And he said, well, you know, I've, I've never worn safety glasses or uncomfortable. I go, and that's fine. I said, because I'm pretty sure in 20 years, they'll have invented, you know, bionic eyes. And, you know, if you damage your eyes, you're going <laughs> to gonna want to look at, you know, you, won't, you can get some bionic ones. I said, but for right now, for right I know they're uncomfortable. You've only got time, one yeah. set of eyes. You've got one set of eyes. I'm just saying to you, I don't care whether you wear them or not. I'm just pointing out to you that in that tiniest, tiniest chance that it goes wrong, you're going to be blind. It's why we have airbags on cars. Well, I, Nobody well, I, goes out in their car and goes, I'm going to crash today. But do you know what? If it goes wrong, we'd like to have an airbag in front of us. Well, this is what I keep telling people, Keith. Listen, I, I never like there always seems to be a bit of this too, I guess. Now, maybe it's just the competitive nature of things. Okay. We are, you know, we are in business and there is a certain like, although the competitiveness is really minor, really, you know, like three percent basically of your business might be involving your competitors. But uh um never, nevertheless, you know, we all kind of think our stuff's the best or want people to think our stuff's the best, right? But would you say, Keith, though, that one of the main improvement benefits, I'm not sure if I'm expressing it properly, but safety too, safety differently, HOP, even BBS, if you actually understood it properly, was to try to get away from safety always being negative, bad, negative consequences, rules, punishment, death, dismemberment, you know, doom, gloom. Like I said, nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear about it typically, you know, that kind of thing. Um, do you think the big benefit of a lot of these new approaches is just that you get people to look at it from a positive perspective? Or if we get down to the gearworks a little bit further, could you take us through, you know, where you think some of the efficiencies in these different um, these I, I, different, I still want to go back. We've only got about five minutes before, like, and there's so many. I can't even look at all the questions. And no, it's, it's absolutely. I'm just looking at the point that Sunny, Sunny, great guy. Uh, Sunny does some really, um, Sunny Gopal does some really fantastic stuff raising the safety agenda, and he's just said there is no magic bullet. Absolutely, there's not. But do you know what we've got to go back to? Whichever one of these picks, do something different tomorrow. Do something different, because if you do something different, you will generate a conversation. Some people will agree with you. Some people will argue with you. But what's happening is, is you've suddenly lifted that safety agenda and people are going, we're doing something different. And that's what get people. People will then question why they've always done something another way. They may turn around and go, actually, you've brought this in. I've questioned what we do and what we do is actually the right thing. We're doing the right things, but it's getting people to suddenly just go through that change curve and just suddenly start talking about something different. Okay, well, let's... You know, let's by let's doing talk. something different, it doesn't matter whether what one you pick up on. What matters is, is you, you've taken the chance, you've invested in people, and you're talking about it in a different way. And that causes the cobwebs and the dust in your brain in the safety part to dust themselves off and you suddenly start looking at things in a different way. Well, let, Keith, t talk to us a bit about that first part, that first turn of the first gear, if you will. Yeah, and absolutely. Sure. So when you're looking at this, how, how I, I challenge, I, I challenge you, right? That connection, that communicator 
in terms of getting that first wheel to turn because I think that part like yeah. for instance you know I'm not trying to flatter you here but there is a bit now of the the messenger and the you know like if, for instance I can easily see you talking to leaders and getting them to listen to you but I could also see you talking to the guys out there at the construction site and yeah. they would listen to you absolutely and that, and that and that, like, how important, because that part maybe isn't something that and, and this is something where we, this is where we lose the disconnect a lot of the time. Because the guys out on the site are usually, like, Albert Einstein said this, Albert Einstein. I'm paraphrasing because it's easy and we haven't got time, but you can't measure a fish by how high it climbs a tree. Okay? And that means if you take a fish and you say to that fish, climb that tree, that fish is for the rest of his life going to think he's useless. If you told me to dive to the depths of the ocean, I'm going to think I'm a failure. And what happens is people come up with these initiatives. You get to the guys on site and the guys on the site get talked to rather than listened to. You don't have this active engagement. And that's the real challenge is that when you introduce these new things, the guys on the site, you know, and I keep saying guys, and I apologize for that. It's just I come from construction, 99% of people in construction. We need to change that demographic, but I apologize. It's, uh, I, I don't even, I'm not sure it's politically incorrect, I, Teeth. I don't uh, know. I, 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 I haven't been to all the courses. To realize when I say guys, me, I, I mess I'm up talking about everyone. Them. But it's definitely about getting those people to engage and, get, and getting people to really kind of go, do you know what? You're caring about me? Because that's let's go right back to the pubs. Let's go right back to the pubs. I used to have a a particularly entertaining set of customers in one pub, and do you know how I won them over? I won them over because one of them came in and he had a problem and he had a challenge and he was hungry and he was stressed and he said, "Oh, this is happening." I said, "Tell you what," and I sat down with him and we actually we have crumpet, you know. Crumpet. I, we are sat down over a plate of Marmite crumpets, and I listened to him, and I said, "Tell me your problem. Just explain it." And in explaining it to me, I didn't understand what he was talking about. But in explaining it to me, he went through the process and he explained it to himself, and he got the solution. And that was just about sitting down with someone and being their friend and talking. And when we go onto site and talk to these guys about why you're not doing this, why you're not doing that, sit them down listen and let them explain because i've been on so many sites and i've said to someone why are you doing it that way not why you're doing it wrong why are you doing it that way and he's explained it to me and he's got halfway through and he's gone yeah that's not particularly safe is it and i've gone no but i didn't want to tell no, you but that. that that was the one you were telling me about the guy cleaning the thing with the wire mesh there and stuff like that and you go oh, that, yeah that's, that's, yeah yeah and, and it was no wonder you were cleaning it that way because it's a lot more efficient right you know or is yeah, that when he explained it we got to a solution, but previously people in that company were being disciplined and fired for cleaning that way. They were just trying to get the job done and get home to their families. Yeah, I know. So I know. It's, it's it was a classic example, actually. I just yeah, uh, it's almost uh, so. So yeah, so we had we had these. It's still going on. Yeah. So Keith, oh. I got, let me move you along to two more things just before we open it up to the the floodgates here. Um, I think the, they're already open, Larry. Of, I'm looking at the chat window, it's going crazy. A lot of like, from drinking and football teams. A lot of what you've talked to before about so far is is the bottom line part about about the caring, the, the being genuine and the you know listening, the engagement. Um, the second part, obviously, though, is is the unintentional error like in other words the 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 slip and fall and hitting your head standing up bang you know all of all of the missing the stop sign or the red light those those mistakes errors or, or if you will skills so on the field like i mentioned the lady uh, gosh i wish i could remember her name but um you've heard numerous people talking about mindfulness which to me seems not as so much improving specific skills like self-triggering or, or working on a habit like moving your eyes first before your hands, feet, body, or car, but 
much more like cardiovascular fitness where you're you're just improving the overall mindfulness or card you know cardiovascular fitness of the athlete so what's your what's your take on it and um what the value is the data so far what you've seen in terms of you know obviously if as somebody who goes down to the shop floor like you I mean, going to teach yoga to guys in the shop floor, the millwrights on the graveyard shift, I'm not really looking forward to it, but I also kind of believe that it's a good thing to do. Yeah, so it's, absolutely, it's definitely getting that engagement. So I worked in London for a little bit, working on the rail. And we had these people that work, because the only time you repair a train is at night when it's not moving. So these people very rarely saw a manager, a director, a senior person or anything like that. And when they did turn up, they thought they were in trouble. So I went down and I actually spoke. I went down and no one would speak to me because they thought when I turned up at this train yard and I went, oh, how's it going? What's this? They were all like, yeah, it's all right. Because they thought I was there to catch them out. They didn't realize. I just wanted them to go, actually, Keith, do you know what? These gloves don't fit. I don't like my boots. I need a longer tea break. And that's what I was there to do. And this is what we've got to encourage leaders to do. Leaders are great at being a radio that's on send. Stop being a radio on send. Turn your waist self into a walkie-talkie and put yourself on receive. Go and talk to the people on site. Turn up with a cup of tea. Turn up with some cakes. Just go, how is it going? Tell me what your problems are. Because trust me, they'll tell you and you'll find out what you need to fix. So in terms of improving mindfulness, that's like not maybe so much having somebody come in and talk about like the Dalai Lama or meditation, but well, Larry, more, what's your I'll definition of well-being? What's your definition of well-being, Larry? Well, I, I'm I'm not I'm not sure just how um, you know I mean I'm, I'm always I, it always seems like I'm I'm, I'm pushing and running, but I kind of like running in fourth gear. So there you, you know go. What? If you talk to someone else, their definition of well-being might be getting home before their children finish school. That yeah. might be their definition of well-being. Their definition of well-being is not going to the gym, not being able to run a marathon. Their definition of well-being is I want to go to sleep at night, have a nice night's sleep, and I want to be able to finish work, leave work, and get home to welcome my children back to school from school. You know, that might be someone's definition of well-being. It might be a case that they want at lunchtime, they want a quiet room to go and read in. That's their well-being. You know, too many people think well-being is about fitness. Well-being is just about being happy and having enjoying what you do as life and being. Well, that was my next segue was going to come from the mindfulness to the. The mental, health, the mental health part you get to talk yeah. to, you know gary foot lots of people that you know I, I think it was actually the glc conference where i first found out that uh, they were losing more construction workers due to suicide than to accidental injury and yet nobody wanted to talk about mental health and that one hit me that was yeah. when i found out that twice like when i when i found out that twice as many children died accidentally as workers that was like another thing that just hit me right between the eyes going well then you know, let's focus on, you know, let's focus on the death for heaven's sakes. But, you know, let's stop that yeah. first, right? Um, but also people may have accidents because there's a distraction at home. They could be, you know, they could be struggling with the mortgage. They could have just found out that, you know, one of their children's has got an illness. They could find out their partner's having an affair. That's going to affect the way you do your job. And that's a distraction. And that can make you unsafe. And that's why his well-being. If you've got someone sitting in your production line that is worrying, can I get home to cook my children tea? Okay, that is something that's going to affect the way they work for you and they're going to work safely. Keith, so you've got to look at well being is about just having engaged and happy people. Yeah, well, it, it, I mean, you've got it, it's all of that. Like, so that now kind of to come to the safety 24 7 thing. Um, you know what? I, I don't. I'll, I'll just open in your take on when. Well, when safety twenty four seven is it? Is it hit the airwaves? What did you know? 
what, what did you hear? What did you think? And then what have you sort of thought since then and so on? Safety 24-7, I find, is a very, very different take. And it is about looking at how we support people and actually getting those examples. A great example of Safety 24-7, where the manager got it slightly wrong, is um, I work for a company, and this woman that was working for us on one of the construction sites really engaged with safety. She understood I need to wear my safety shoes to do this. I need to do that. So she was cutting the grass. Now, normally, and I know a lot of us have probably done it, we cut the grass in our trainers. When we're at home, we don't follow the same thing. So trainers, she went home. Trainers are running shoes for those of us. Flip-flops, bare feet. But she went home and she went, oh, I'm going to cut my grass. Well, maybe I should wear my steel toe caps from work because wear your steel toe caps from work if it goes wrong. And do you know what? That day she made that decision, it went wrong. And she ran over her feet with the lawnmower. And what she did, she damaged a pair of boots that had been paid for by the company. So she had to go in the next day to her manager and go, look, I'm really sorry. I've damaged my safety equipment. And the manager was going to punish her. And I went, whoa, you've just won a battle there. You've got someone that understands doing the right things. I said, and not only that, if she hadn't damaged. What, you just won the lottery 60, and you want to throw the ticket. Absolutely. Tick you have got, if, if she had damaged, if she hadn't worn and damaged your 60 pound pair of boots, you would now be paying 200 pound a day to backfill that position by getting a temp in. You'd have to buy new equipment. You'd have sickness pay. You'd have someone that you've trained and invested in, not at work. And people don't realize an accident at home, someone being absent from work from being injured at home can cost you probably two, three hundred dollars a day at least. And that's why well, you need to get your staff to understand. It comes a lot more, Keith. It just comes yeah, absolutely. Out of, it comes out of a different pool of money and it's it still money fairly affect your total recordable injury rate. So. Uh, it's been one of the things I've struggled with for years because, you know, our stuff works on and off the job. And in, you know, in the United States, I mean, the companies pay for all of the injuries to all of the employees and all of their dependents 24 seven. So you can, you know, the, the idea, first of all, that it's none of your business when you only are trying to help people is, is a cop out in my opinion. The, but the next part is when you're actually paying for the entries in the hospitalization, for someone to say it's none of your business is just inaccurate because you're paying for it. But there is still a great reluctance, even in North America, to really take, you know, we talked about this before, even, even something as straightforward as vehicular safety, when they know that likely the next serious injury and fatality is most likely going to come from a motor vehicle accident, or a forklift, not necessarily confined space entry, working at heights, high voltage, high temperature, high pressure, et cetera, right? So what, what about the safety 24 seven? What have you seen, good, bad? I mean, you told me there's some people that say, you know, have even said, oh, it's a structured program. I thought that was incredulous. Um, it, it, it is interesting, but, but let's look at that accident iceberg. So let's just forget about cost, about the cost to the company in money about that bottom line. If you've got, if you're at work and your best friend had an accident at home and severely injured themselves, they're still your friend. So when you're at work, are you thinking about how poorly your friend is or are you thinking about your job, which again is going to affect productivity? So there is a case an accident is an accident and it affects morale. It affects well-being. It affects how people interact at work. And it is the case that, yes, we're talking money, but there is research done in the UK showed that for every pound an accident costs you, there is nearly up to 36 pound that is unclaimable, that's not insured, that you can't recover in a business. The mm -hmm. unhidden cost. So, you know, have a look on my website, guys. There's a poster on there called the Incident Iceberg. Have a look at the poster, and it talks about all the other things and the true cost of any injury to anyone, be it friend, family or worker, is often hidden below that surface. And it's only when, you know, COVID is really showing this right now 
because you've got people that are suffering and being ill from COVID, and it really is hitting families, um, cultures, communities for six, because suddenly that someone has just come and taken someone away from you. So you've got to look at engaging, but absolutely tw safety 24 seven. It's just about caring about people. And that's what we do as safety professionals. Well, and that, that kind of brings us back to, I mean, I, and I, I know, cause I've talked to you. So like everybody, like, Keith and I talked for two hours in the rehearsal for this show. <laughs> so we're now getting very close to the hour being up. So many questions. There was one, though, that um, uh, almost a perennial question. It's it's off the screen now, so I can't, I can't credit whoever asked. I'm just going to say the question. Um, but the, it was about, Keith, the, you know, when you've got deadlines and pressures and managers um, and how sometimes safety then uh, you know, gets the priority, as you say, is 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 less, or it, it, the production takes priority. Um, we are actually doing a safe connection expert panel on uh, production versus safety. It's it's March the fourth in North America. Um, we'll let you know. I think it's going to be March eleventh in, in Europe in the Middle East, but. I've got some, you know, production versus safety, you know, truth or myth too. There's a, uh, it could just be that I did it for production was the best excuse to everybody. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but only the excuses that work survive. You don't tell your boss that the Martians stole your homework, do you? You might have said it in grade three, but you're not saying it anymore. And I did it for production. Works pretty good. So there's 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 more than just the surface there. But Keith, when when there is an opportunity, safety versus production, there's a challenge, there's a real deadline. Any any practical advice you could throw out there and you know well I, I want to challenge you on that and I'd say safety versus production. Yeah, hey, I'm just asking I'm just asking the question that yeah, was no, no, I'm, I'm gonna question. challenge there because for me in the production environment and I've worked in a five I've worked in a five five S environment in production where it was just in time and we had some really interesting thing. And it was basically coming back to the fact that, do you know what, if you are in production and you cut corners and you don't do things correctly in production and your production line stops, that costs you money. If you injure someone on a production line, that costs you money. So in a production point of view, it's cold, but safety is another quality item. If you've got someone on a production line, yeah, 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 Keith. But if I don't speed, we're going to miss the plane. Now, you want to miss the plane, or do you want me to speed? What do you want me to do? Well, uh, do you know what? What then happens? You speed and you fail in your production for the simple reason that you've accidentally, instead of cutting someone's finger with that knife that you're sealing the box with. So I worked in aircraft manufacturing. Each of those aircraft seats had to be delivered in the right order to be put on a Boeing seven four seven. Okay. They had to go in the right order. And if you damaged, there were over 36 seat, different designs of seat on an average plane. And if you damaged one of those aluminium spars on that seat, that seat, you had to stop production till that seat was ready to go back in. So I haven't injured a person. If I'm not doing production correctly, if I damage that, if that knife sealing that box didn't cut the production operative, but went through the box and cut the seat, I've still stopped production. Safety okay. is another it, it, quality item in production. We're just, we're just gonna have to have you as one of the expert panelists on the show there for the I want to finish with one this, thing though, Larry. I want to finish with one safety, thing. Because you got you've got so I'm much gonna keep that. I'm gonna hold that up, all right? Oh please, yeah. You did want to continue. That's the reason. That. Now I do have to say this is the most ironic poster I've probably done. Because as you can see. The letters I've used to spell out the acronym key, KISS, aren't particularly simple, are they? <laughs> so us British, we love irony. So there you go. There is an ironic poster about telling you to keep it simple, stupid. Make it easy. People will do follow the easy way. So if the safe way is the easy way, people will do safety naturally. So let's make people's lives easier and we will all be a little bit safer. That sounds pretty catchy. Safety naturally with Keith Hall. That's pretty good, Keith. I can see us having another conversation, Larry. 
Well, I, it's, no, it's I, a good job we're a couple of thousand miles apart and we haven't got any beer between us because well, I we'd definitely I, be putting the world to rights. Look, it, it is, it, it is. We are, we are on the hour. Um, Mike, um, uh, these are some of the people in the background. Everybody, any um, any burning questions that you could throw on the screen that Keith could try to answer? And uh, let me just grab a drink. I would say I don't usually talk this much, but there's people in that chat window that will tell you that's a lie. Yeah, well, and I, I don't know, Keith. I mean, uh, I, I know you know lots of the folks, and certainly I recognized a few names as they were coming up myself. Um, thank you very much, everybody, though, for uh, for, for all all the interest and everything. Although uh, um, I must say, is with so many coming in, I found that I... Uh, if I if I started reading them all, Keith, I was having trouble listening as well. So uh, I apologize, everybody, for not getting to all of them um, as much as we'd like. Um, Keith, I'd like to thank you very much, first of all, for uh, well, for taking the um, taking the time on the show today, but but also for your you know for your for your interest and in, uh, you know for coming up to me and having me come to the the conference in Berlin, having me open up the, the virtual conferences um, since COVID started. And, uh, you know, the other one that we, the other one that we did it, we did in the fall. Um, really looking forward again to, uh, well, to having you on the expert panel show, but also everybody to seeing you live and seeing Keith live, uh, you know, in person when we can uh, once again, you know, go and present audiences live. The webinars are all good, but there's certainly something that's just a little more intimate or tangible. And at the GLC conferences, you know, they try to keep them to, you know, two, 300 people so that it's not like you're talking to 2000 and it's a, a distant crowd. So again, Sylvia, thanks very much. Uh, Christian, Dory, all, all the GLC people. And Keith, I've, thank you very much for taking the time to talk. I've with got us. one question, Larry, one question. Sure. I, unfortunately, I you know, your book, Yes. I had to give it away to someone. Can I have another one? <laughs> you certainly can. copy as well. Yeah, uh, defenseless moments, everybody. Yes, yeah. yeah. I'm very smoking. sorry about that. No, I, I would talk about your book, but I can't because someone stole it off me because I loved it. Oh, so <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much, Keith, and also for all the, all the kind words you've said too, but, uh, you know, all the stuff we're doing for the kids and the families and helping us with all getting all that going in Europe again. It's uh, like I said, when I found out that twice as many kids died as workers every year, I kind of thought, yeah, well, then that's where you got to get this stuff. And um, the latest sort of research, five, 500 different case study, like the actual reports of fatal injuries, Keith, and um, you know, we're, we're all talking about serious injuries and fatalities and how come the serious injuries and fatalities haven't come down. And if you look at nationwide graphs, it, it's a bit perplexing. But if you actually, if you've got the stomach for it to read 500 fatal injury reports, and I, let me tell you, this is not, um, don't do more than 20 a day because it'll, it'll affect you. Um, I, I couldn't do more than 20 a day. What you realize is that 90 plus percent of them happen to companies that have less than five, not even 10 employees. So, you know, if we don't get this stuff out to the schools, Keith, if we don't get it out to the apprentices and the trade schools, the kind of folks that come to these conferences, they're not the ones that are having the majority of the fatalities, right? So, you know, there is a bit everybody of being able, you know, being able to show a better positive way as leading companies if we're really going to change a lot of this as well too because so many of those little guys they think safety is a negative they think it's a pain and it's a nuisance it's a cost of doing business it's a waste of money and there's a lot of those paradigms that are definitely needing to get changed. Anyhow, Keith, I don't get off my own soapbox. You said it so many times yourself. It really is about getting that care and concern across. I think the other thing you said, getting that first initial engagement was really important, you know, so that the whoever it is, to get them to listen to it, to get that first sprocket to turn. And then the thing I also really liked was 
focus on one thing, nail it, make it a success, and then showcase the success, and you'll get more people pulling for you on the next initiative. I thought that was I thought that was That's brilliant. That, that, if anything, is the key takeaway. Do one thing well, celebrate it, and then let's move on to the next challenge. Keep it simple. Keep it simple, Stu. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to wave goodbye. Thanks to everyone that's tuned in. I know this is going to be up. If people have missed it or want to retune, it's going to be list on the website, isn't it? They can rewatch it. Oh, yeah, and, and, and the podcast, everybody. And if you can, in two weeks, um, I am going to have uh, – I think I got this right, Mike. Um, I should just – check this to be oh, Mike's just thrown it up on the screen for you you've got a hundred percent sure yeah it is on march on march the 11th with um jim spigner um from decra uh formerly you know uh bst DECRA, great and, company and I, and i mentioned i mentioned jim before um you know yeah but um ladies and gentlemen if, if you're familiar with malcolm gladwell's book the tipping point Jim is the man who tipped behavior-based safety. I, I know Thomas Krauss and uh, Scott Geller kind of argue about who's the father of behavior-based safety. I think that's kind of interesting because the DuPont company had been doing it for years and years before then. And that, I, I'd actually started before then, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> by the way, somebody offers you a job talking to people your dad's age about their behavior when you're 28, <laughs> you might want to think about it. But anyhow, um, these guys maybe were the experts, or to use Gladwell's terminology, the mavens. But Jim Spigner was the front man or the salesman, in my opinion, that sold behavior-based safety to the world. It was relative obscurity in 1990s, and by by the mid 1990s, it, it was it was it was global. Keith, you've met Jim, you've met Jim before. It's phenomenal and. Incredible storyteller. Great guy. I heard him talk many times. That it, you know, really, just you know, an enthusiastic and just someone that really helps draw out those conversations. Yeah, I know. And just like you, Keith, you can you know, you can feel the care, you can feel the compassion, you can feel you can feel the concern. Okay, so hopefully you can tune in, everybody, and uh, you can hear how behavior based safety really got started with Jim. Keith, thank you so much for, uh, if you will, cutting through. Uh, so much of the you know so much of everything to get us to the the real essence of all these new initiatives really appreciate it and and thank you very much everybody for all the comments and questions and everything uh we'll see you next time okay bye bye everybody thanks a lot bye